Hello and welcome to this episode of Mining Matters, a part of the In Dialogue series hosted by the Non-Fuel Minerals and Mining Research Team led by Dr. Rajesh Chadha at the Center for Social and Economic Progress, New Delhi. We invite experts from India and abroad to discuss how India's mining sector can become a catalyst for economic growth and development, ensuring fair and sustainable mining practices for the environment and affected communities. Hello, I am Ishita Kapoor. I'm with the Minerals and Mining team at CFEP. So expanding a vibrant non-fuel mining sector is necessary for providing essential raw materials for manufacturing industries and employment opportunities across the economy while adding fiscal gains for state governments. So however, all this must be done in a, in a framework that is consistent with climate change concerns. CSEP is intensifying its research program uh, in non-fuel minerals and mining in India, an area that has not received much research attention otherwise. Given its commitment to climate change mitigation and adaptation, India needs to ensure its mineral security for the future of clean energy generation, electric vehicles, and high-tech manufacturing. So in addition, many of the districts in the country with significant mineral resources are inhabited by some of the poorest communities. And the development of mining could help bring in jobs and wider social development. The work program seeks to provide guidelines for the policy regime that enable sustainable growth of the non-fuel mining sector in alignment with the welfare of affected communities and environmental protection. Mining program at CSEP is part of the Energy, Natural Resources and Sustainability Vertical. It is led by Dr. Rajesh Chadha. My colleague Ganesh Sivamini and I work on various focus areas of the mining sector. Some of our recent studies have been on auction, critical minerals, and normative aspects such as sustainability, environmental issues, and post-lease clearance issues. Please do refer to the CSEP website to access all of our research and publications. So welcome everyone to the first in the series of discussions called Mining Matters. The Mining Matters is a subset of the CSEP's In Dialogue series. Which, uh, which is a special series to uh, discuss with scholars issues on the social and economic progress of India in the global context. So I'm very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Nick Senapati today. He is uh, the president of the Australia India Business Council in Queensland. He is a, a geologist and has spent over 35 years in the mining industry with roles in exploration, operations, strategy, and external relations. Until 2015, uh, Dr. Senapati was uh, the country head of Rio Tinto in India. He, uh, he has been instrumental in establishing the Sustainable Mining Initiative for the Indian mining industry and has initiated the Skills Council in the mining sector. Um, he has also been the chairman of the Federation of Indian Chamber of uh, Commerce and Industry in Australia. He is on the Advisory Council of the Mining Program at CSEP. So a very warm welcome uh, to Dr. Senapati. Thank and, you. And so uh, today we're going to discuss uh, multiple issues relating to exploration, auctions and sustainability including the environment and the affected communities. So we know that India has an extensive uh, geological potential, but it is underutilized. So according to some sources, only about 10% of the obvious geological potential, that is the OGP, has been explored. So in your opinion, how does it compare with other mining jurisdictions, particularly Australia, given that it has a very similar geology to India? So thank you, Vishfa. And um, the uh, geological potential of India is uh, enormous. Uh, we have, uh, it has been very limited ex exploration taken place in, in India. Most of the exploration in India uh, goes back many, many years with the Geological Survey of India. And that was broad-based uh, geological um, 
work that was done. Uh, the geology of, of India, given that uh, India was, at least peninsular India, was connected with uh, Australia and South Africa during the Gondwana period, the, the geology in both Australia and India uh, are similar uh, on the peninsula of India. And therefore, one would expect to find many of the minerals that uh, have been found in Australia uh, in India as well. Now, some of them have been found, but the exploration effort really has not, has been limited to the government sector and the private sector has not really uh, started to explore uh, India in a comprehensive way. So the, the potential is there, huge potential, uh, as you said, only um, there. You could say 2% or 10% or something, you know, a very small number of, uh, uh, of percentage of the area has actually been thoroughly explored in a geological sense. So, uh, as you mentioned that uh, there's less private involvement, but uh, in 1993, the Mines and Minerals Development and Regulation Act, MMDR, was amended to allow private sector investments in the mineral exploration in India through the first come first serve system. So this would have obviously impacted uh, the new investments in the mining sectors. So uh, do you think that the 1993 M MMDR amendments uh, have had an impact on the mining investments in India? Absolutely. It was uh, 93 that uh, started to see um, some private investment coming in, uh, foreign investment, but uh, foreign exploration companies, but also some Indian companies exploring in India. Uh, and that first come first serve basis was, uh, was a, a good start to the process in the sense that uh, it encouraged people to come in. It was still at uh, a 74%, uh, or I think it actually started at 51% mm -hmm. or uh, FDI mm -hmm. and then grew to 74%. So you did still had to find partners to, to come in and explore in India. And given that um, partners in India didn't really understand exploration the way the uh, foreign mining companies had uh, yeah. knew about exploration, the risk factors, et cetera, it took a bit of time to get going. Um, so, but by the by the two uh, thousands, uh, there were there was quite a bit of uh, exploration happening in India, particularly in the. I'm talking about the deep seated minerals, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, in diamonds, in the kimberlites that were being uh, discovered, as well as uh, some of the base metals in Rajasthan and Karnataka. So, oh, despite. Um, so much exploration coming in, we can see that FDI from the mining sector in India is only about half a percent of the total FDI. That is uh, about only three billion US dollars uh, from 2002 to 2020, So we can, and despite this, even with those three billion dollar US dollars coming in, we can see that some of the FDI has not fructified into operating mines. So why do you think uh, that this has happened and particularly it has slowed down after 2010? Yeah. So exploration uh, is, is, a, is a science. One has to think about it as uh, geologists looking, testing a hypothesis uh, to find uh, a deposit. Now, the, the risk factor in this, especially in the amount of uh, capital that is put into exploration, uh, the risk factors are very high. And it's usually, you know, it's some, there are various figures, but one in a thousand deposits that are found actually turn out to be economic. So it takes time to actually um, develop and uh, very often it isn't the first person who explores, but it's the second or third or fourth person who explores the same area that, that discovers and works out how, how a deposit uh, is, is there. So um, it, takes, it takes some time for that to happen. Um, the other factor is that uh, it took some time to get the, um, 
to get permitting to be able to do exploration. So um, India was mm-hmm. still at its infancy stages of, of working out what exploration was about and what was needed to, uh, to take place. So for instance, as you mentioned in your introduction, a lot of these areas have uh, are in communities where they're tribal communities or, or uh, they are uh, forested areas. So permitting had to be done. And that also took time and understanding there was um, you know, forest clearance, wildlife clearance, mm-hmm. environmental clearance to be able to, to start exploring in those areas. So it took some time to get to that. That it probably a lot of exploration focused on diamond exploration. And it was an ex- example of the success of that was that uh, prior to about uh, the late 90s, uh, the, the Geological Survey had been exploring for kimblites uh, and had found uh, a few of them. None of them were, apart from perhaps Panna, uh, were, were actually um, economic. Uh, but after exploration started with the private companies, there were 50, 60 kimberlites found in the next four or five years. And um, that was because of the focus of private exploration, new technologies, new thoughts, uh, et cetera. So that just showed that it was the potential is there. And that's just in um, looking at diamonds. I am not... I, similar things would happen in other base metals as well. So not out of those, uh, I think, that have been found, only one got to a stage of being, uh, to a stage where it's possibly economic to develop. So, you know, that's the sort of risk profile that, uh, that exploration companies take on. So um, speaking of exploration, um, the Fraser Institute in Canada conducts the annual survey of mining companies, so which uh, in which they create two indices on the investment attractiveness and the best mining practices, uh, looking at various mining jurisdictions about ranging from 80 to 100. So India used to be evaluated till 2016, but has been dropped out of the Fraser in- indices since. 2017 due to multiple reasons. So do you think that this uh, has had an impact on India's mining attractiveness as well? Well, to, you know, since 2010, what happened was, as far as I understand, um, the, there were a whole lot of issues in the way allocation of resources were taking place, particularly in the bulk minerals, um, iron ore, coal, um, bauxite and perhaps limestone, but um, in those bulk uh, minerals, there were some issues, and there was a there was definitely a view that the government was moving more and more to an auctioning process rather than a first come first serve basis. So that uh, had an impact on people. Uh, they were obviously concerned that. Um, the legislation was changing and what impact that would have uh, of investment in in, in exploration. Uh, But then the Fraser uh, Institute is, is, they they measure this all over the world. And uh, the fact that they have now stopped measuring India uh, Mm -hmm. is a demonstration that it's not attractive for foreign uh, investment to come into exploration uh, in India, and the, as well as uh, I think the uh, Fraser Institute requires a certain number of companies to contribute to their indices, and if those, if then those companies, they aren't those companies in India uh, because they're not, they're not attra- India is not attractive enough. Then they're not contributing to that uh, indice either. Yeah. So I think uh, yes, the the Fraser Institute definitely has an has an impact on people looking at India and saying, well, should we go there or should we not? And mm-hmm. uh, there are other options that uh, exploration companies have. They've got the, the world that, uh, that yeah. they can go to, and they may go to somewhere where they think it's easier to, to explore. Although the potential of India is huge, it yeah. may be easier to explore elsewhere. So you mentioned uh, the introduction of the auction system in 2015. 
So uh, the MNDR was amended to introduce uh, the system of mineral auctions to allocate exploration and mining leases. So uh, how do you think that this new auction regime has impacted uh, the exploration in India? I know we've already discussed uh, it a little, but um, but yes, H- how do you think it has impacted? Well, I think uh, exploration companies uh, are not uh, conducive to the auction process. Uh, on two, two grounds. One is that um, there are uh, many places in the world that don't have auctioning of, of mm-hmm. exploration and they have that first come first served process, uh, which uh, is more attractive. The second one is that it is very difficult to auction something that if you don't know what it is that you're auctioning. Mm-hmm. So if it's a defined deposit, and well drilled and well well explored, uh, you know what the constraints are as far as clearances and licensing, et cetera, goes on that deposit, then perhaps you could auction that as, as a known entity. But if you're looking at something where you want somebody to come and just look for something, how do you auction? It's very difficult to auction something that you don't know if it's there or not. Uh, and the other aspect of that is that most deposits, this is my uh, uh, theory, is that most deposits in the world are found in a geologist's head before they're found in the ground. So if a geologist has an idea to that maybe there's a deposit in a location X, they would be reluctant to share that with anybody because it's their idea. Yeah. And, and therefore, if they f- are allowed to explore and it is, turns out to be correct, their hypothesis is correct, then they expect some return from that in, in, yes. because it was their idea. It's their IP. So I think that um, that's where there is this conflict between auctioning and the first come, first serve. Mm. In the bulk minerals, I think it's a, it's a little easier because the bulk minerals are better defined. I'm not saying it's at, it's it's the best process, but there is a. I think there is some cases where auctioning could work in the in the bulk minerals. So, given that now the auction system is here to uh, stay, what do you think should be our optimum policy regime, future policy regime to maximize, um, yes, the adoption of the auction system? I think it's a it's a very difficult uh, process because I think, as I said, in the bulk minerals, perhaps auctioning is is the way to go. But in the in the deeper unexplored areas uh, and where there's much more uncertainty, um, I think auction, auctioning just is not a way which will attract people to come and spend their money in in um, in India. Uh, there are lots of other places which are more attractive. Uh, so it would be, it, I think it would be difficult to attract people into an auctioning process, into an unknown area of, uh, of um, exploration. So well, I, I, he, I'm not yeah. sure if I'm answering your question <laughs> of what should be the, I mean, because yeah. I know the courts and the government are committed to the auctioning process in India. And, and the only other way of doing that is for, I, I can think, is the government to spend their money defining the deposits. And once defined, they can then auction those off. But that is, that is a very expensive way, and it's using taxpayers' money at a huge risk, yeah. uh, where you could actually get private companies to spend their money rather than taxpayers' money uh, and uh, not have that risk. So I think the, the government has a role to play. And I know they put a, they have a fund, uh, an exploration yeah. fund that... Um, and met, yeah. Yeah, that is, is, uh, that is, is to help enough? in this yeah. regard. But as I said before, the government exploration or non-private sector exploration has a different incentive to find things. And therefore, the efficiency, the technology, et cetera, 
tends to um, make it such that um, it's it's less efficient and less yeah. effective. So um, you mentioned the um, Exploration Trust, that is the National Mineral Exploration Trust, and met that um, the government has created. So basically, two percent, two um, percent of uh, the royalty uh, basically two percent is paid into these funds by the mining companies so speaking of um, the taxation issues um, so the auction winner is supposed to pay additional auction premium to the government so uh, while transitioning uh, to the auction premium and paying this additional uh, auction system and paying this additional premium Royalty is still charged on the ore production. So, um, how how do you think that this affects the effective taxation uh, rate of taxation, as well as obviously compared to uh, the other mining jurisdictions around the world? So, I think it puts India at a huge disadvantage because the the whole auctioning process, even for the bulk, well defined minerals that have been there. My understanding is that the auction process has meant that people have bid over 100% of the uh, contribution that they're going to get from, from mining it. So to get just to get access to the resource, maybe that's, that will calm down over time and there'll be less, but it is still, it will still be much, much higher than any other place in um, in the world as far as a percentage of royalty going to the government. And, uh, and I think when, when foreign companies looking at India, they'll say, where else in the world can we explore for that mineral? And what are the royalty rates in that, in that location? So what's the advantage of, um, of going to India? And and not being able to get a similar sort of benefit. Equally, I mean, there, there are other taxes as well. As it is royalty, just on a pure royalty on um, ad valorem basis is much higher than most places, or a bit higher than most places in the world. But if you add on that, the, the, the taxes, as well as the auction royalty premium that one is paying, it's, it's, uh, it becomes quite um, difficult to make a case for India being attractive to invest in. The other, the other thing with auctioning uh, that I think has happened is that people, there is, a, there is a tendency to for the emotion to come into auctioning. Um, people bid higher than they, they um yeah. They, that, they, that is viable economically. And then what happens is the deposit doesn't get developed and it yes. sits around for till either the government takes it back or, um, or it just doesn't get developed at all. I mean, so I don't think it's conducive to um, a, the developing of a mining industry. So, um, yes, um, moving forward, uh, I would like to discuss some sustainability issues as well. Yep. So uh, mining set up its operation life and post closure can have an impact on the environment and the livelihood of the affected communities. So while uh, post lease clearances need to be efficient so that the mining operation uh, can be started, sometimes these can take time. So you mentioned earlier as well, um, that it takes time to get these uh, clearances and set up to actually start production. So how do you think that this should be dealt with or improved? So I think uh, India is not unique in this area is taking time. Uh, if you look at uh, any new deposit that's found around the world, it takes years to get mm -hmm. it to production. Uh, and a lot of that is taken up in in the um, community and environmental processes, uh, which are all absolutely essential to be for to get the license to operate, because at the end of the day, the mine is going to have an impact on the environment, 
and it, the mine is going to impact the communities around that that mine positively hopefully more positively than negatively yeah. but that process has to take place so i think in india is exactly the same one needs to go through those uh those proper processes to bring the community uh make sure you get all the environmental studies etc done um and that uh, when the mining does start there is there is agreement amongst the community that that yeah. that is acceptable um um activity to happen in that location one of the things that is i find very important in probably post exploration but before as a mining approvals take place is that there is a clear picture of the life of mine and what is the what is it going to look like at the end of yeah. of the mine so the life of mine plan and the end of mine plan needs to be set right up front so people know what your end picture is going to look like um because you know if there's going to be a hole in the ground that's filled with water you want to know what that looks like and where it's going to be and what impact it's going to have on the environment and the community so that that's an important process the in the life of mine and post and the closure mm -hmm. plan has to be part of the initial plan of the of the mine yeah. and the um the processes in india i think will will only improve the more the government can help in uh defining those uh requirements and um defining the the approval processes up front uh, the easier it's going to be for people to come and uh, and start activities yeah. so what do you think besides these are some of the best practices um in this regard that you have seen around the world yeah or oh, there there are many many good practices um and i i i could there there is the um probably one can refer to the uh, icmm which is the yeah. uh, um the body that um which is a sustainable mining uh, initiative that formed the uh, the the icmm which actually brings together a lot of these studies and they actually have many examples of of best practice and uh, guidelines as to how one can carry out the, this this sort of work as well so other than my explaining it all i think uh, re reference to the icmm would be uh, would be the way to go yeah. so um talking about mine closure um plans so in india we are uh, you are supposed as you mentioned that uh, you're supposed to design and um present a mine closure plan before uh, the start of the production activity however in the end we do see that some areas do not implement these plans properly how, how do you think this could be improved going forward sorry you dropped out a bit there so oh. i i understood that um it you said that um uh, how do you improve the end of mine plans going forward yes. in it yeah the mine closure the implementation of these mine closure plans yeah well i think there needs to be a clear contract with the community and with the uh the government as to uh, and the authorities as to how uh that is going to happen and that needs to be monitored over time it can be fixed in stone and never changed because things mm -hmm. things develop things the geology isn't an absolute thing you'll find something that you didn't expect etc so you can't have it locked in stone but it needs yeah. there needs to be a contract right up front as to what's going to happen and that needs to be reviewed over time that um that agreement needs to have things in it that uh, the communities would require what the authorities would require and those need to be well documented and monitored over time as well so best practice that i've seen around the i mean i'm just let's talk about you know what's happening in australia with mining companies most mining companies or 
I would say all mining companies now have agreements with yeah. indigenous communities um, that that then are monitored over time and the benefits, uh, et cetera, are, are clearly understood and, and, um, and delivered. So th- those are the sorts of things that have to happen uh, because at the end of the day, the, the license to operate yeah. for the mining company only comes from the community. And if the community doesn't want you there, they'll stop you. So it's in your best interest uh, as a as a mining business mm. to have that agreement with the community and have a good relationship with the community and authorities on what you're doing. Yes, definitely. So uh, finally, let us talk a little bit about um, the recent Australia India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement, the uh, ECTA. So, what are your views uh, on that? Well, it's 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 fantastic that it's uh, it's happened. It's taken. Um, I mean, I know it's the there's still more to go on getting to a fair uh, a free trade agreement, uh, but it is a good a really good start. Uh, it's taken you know 15 years or more to to get to this stage. Uh, so uh, I think um, that that's great. From a there are I mean there are lots of industries that would benefit from this. Uh, but talking about the mining industry, I think uh, uh, there is opportunity. It, there are lots of opportunities for Australian companies uh, and Indian companies to uh, to do business together. Particularly the Australian MET sector, which is the mining, engineering, technology, and services. Regardless of whether uh, companies can come and operate mines in India or find it economic to do so or explore in India. India still has a large mining industry. Yeah. And, and for them to continue to develop into best practice and world and have world class operations, they will require the MET sector to come and help do that, uh, or at least ben- uh, for India to benefit from what the technologies and services that. Uh, that Australia could provide. So that's a that's an example of uh, where this uh, trade agreement uh, will help. Um, but there, you know, education, uh, agriculture, they just they're all the industries. Yeah. I mean, even my, I mean, take again, education is an overall one, but mining education is an example where I think um, the benefit could uh, could develop. So students coming from the student and, and research between Australia and India uh, in the mining sector could could well benefit from this agreement as well. I think the other aspect in the agreement that, um, you know, why has it taken so long and why has it happened now is that, you know, the, the geopolitical environment of the world has changed. The um, Australia's relationship with China has changed. Yeah. Um, Australia is looking for other markets uh, to diversify from from their reliance on China. I think India provides that opportunity, um, as well as uh, the technologies of the world are changing, and the um, and the minerals that are required in the lower energy or lower carbon emission technologies. Um, Australia has a lot of those. India probably does and needs exploring for that. Um, yeah. The processing can happen in India. So I think there, there are a number of um, geopolitical aspects that have actually moved the, the needle as well. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's an exciting time uh, with the relationship between Australia and India. Thank you so much. So... Um... On that note, I would uh, I would like to thank you again, Dr. Senapati, for this insightful discussion. I think um, we were able to get answers for some of uh, some very difficult questions that have been revolving around the mining sector for uh, quite some time. But uh, but yes, it, it was it was a great discussion, very insightful. Um, and thank you, thank you so much for uh, joining us on this first uh, 
first discussion in uh, Mining Matters. Thank you, Rishita, and I really uh, enjoyed the discussion and uh, hope others get some benefit out of it as well. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.